So it's finally here, the laptop I've wanted to buy for over a year now. And that is a MacBook Pro with Apple Silicon that's bigger than 13 inches. Probably about two years ago now, I was wanting to get a new MacBook Pro because I went to the store and tried a 16 inch and just realized how much better the keyboard is than my, 16, than my 2016 15 inch. But because Apple Silicon was on, on the horizon, I kind of waited a little bit. Saw the M1 launch, it looked amazing, but I just wanted a bigger screen. And in particular, also things like the ability to run dual monitors that the M1 doesn't support. So since the, the M1 came out, I've watched every Apple event and got extremely frustrated at all the announcements of watches and phones and fitness plans and things I really don't care about. And because I've just wanted them to launch this. But yep, last week they did the launch event, I watched it and ordered this. And it's finally arrived. Actually on launch day, launch day surprisingly. So yeah, time to take a look at it. Now this won't be a full review video. This is more going to be a sort of unboxing, quick setup, do a tour of it, and then do a few benchmark tests. I'll then go away, use it for a while, and then if there's anything to report, I'll do a video on it. If I find that there's no real interesting things to report beyond what I've said in this video, I might not bother. But I might do if there's interesting things come up. But yeah, let's take a look at what I've bought. I've not even taken it out of the shipping box yet because I want to capture, capture all this on camera. I don't know, because I'm sad or something. But yeah, let's tear it open and see what we got. Because I've wanted this thing for so long. And there it is. Well, the, the, there's the other box inside the box, but yeah. So let's take a look at what I got. Because I had spent far too much money on this thing, but I cannot wait to try and try it out and see how it is. And yeah, this is probably going to be a very rambly video. And I know people get extremely irrationally angry if I make a video about an Apple product especially and don't just show the products and I talk about it and talk about my buying rationale and stuff. So as always, there'll be, there'll be timestamps in the video description and on the video seek bar. So you can skip to the part that you want if you want to just see the, see the laptop and not hear me talk about it. But yeah, this is what I went for. And here it is. Here's the specs. And yep, I went for 16 inch because I did want the bigger screen size. And yeah, I may have gone for the top spec pre-configured one and it's cost far too much money. But I do have a reason for that. So yep, this is a top spec pre-configured 16 inch. So when I say pre-configured, it's not got things like 64 gigs of RAM or huge SSDs. It's the top spec one that was available as like a retail, not custom one. So this has a 10 core M1 Max with the 32 core GPU, 32 gigs of RAM and a terabyte SSD. So yeah, it is going to be stupidly powerful and it's way more than I need. Now this isn't actually the first one I ordered. On launch day after the event, I jumped straight in as soon as the store came up and ordered one. And that was a base model 16 inch with 32, 32 gigs of RAM. So I ordered the base model which had the M1 Pro 512 gig SSD and for £400, which was a lot, I upgraded to 32 gigs of RAM because I'm going to have this a while. I want to have that future RAM capacity and I do, do use, use things like Docker which runs virtual machines so having RAM is quite useful for that. And that machine cost 2799 and it's actually coming on Friday, I need to return it when it arrives. And that was going to be fine. And I looked at the other configuration options because I was tempted by the 24 core GPU M1 Max, which is about £200 more. But doing any of that sort of configuration was pushing the delivery estimate up to December. And that was just too far off, I didn't want that. So I settled on the 2799 one, which was the base model with 32 gigs of RAM. So I ordered that, that was all fine. But then Costco sent out an email announcing they had these available for sale. And they had this one, which is the top spec, for £3,049. So yeah, this machine's normally £3,299 from Apple. Costco had it for £3,049, which is still a ridiculous amount of money and I'm still trying to process how much I've spent on a laptop. But that's £250 cheaper than Apple for this. And that gives the faster CPU and the terabyte SSD. If I were to apply these upgrades to the one I bought from Apple, the terabyte SSD would have cost £200 more and the M1 Max 32 core would have cost £300 more. So this costs 50 quid more than just getting the terabyte SSD on its own and 50 quid less than getting the 32 core GPU and keeping the 512 gig SSD. So yes, it was a stupid amount of money and I did kind of jump at it because it was a good deal rather than because I need it. It's here now. Time to take a look at it. The other thing that's also worth mentioning is that by buying this from Costco, at least at the time of filming and in the UK, you got a two year extended warranty. So you get the first year of Apple Care as standard, but then after that year, you get another year of like a Costco warranty, which probably isn't as good as Apple Care. You know, you're not getting the support from Apple, you're getting it from Costco, but it's better than nothing. 
And given a year of Apple Care on this to add on costs something like £300, £400, it's like a stupid amount. Getting that additional extra year of warranty is quite good. Obviously it doesn't include accidental damage and stuff, but it means that if there was a problem, you know, the keyboard broke, the screen started playing up, something like that, some significant failure, I've at least got some sort of way to get it repaired rather than having to fee pay some exorbitant fee after a year because it broke and was out of warranty. So that's definitely not to be sniffed at. So it's now time to unbox this. And this will be my first time seeing one of these in person. I've deliberately resisted the urge to like pop into the Apple store and see if they had one there or anything like that. And I've maybe watched a couple of videos about, of it, but not really that many. So I've been sort of trying to like keep the surprise for seeing it in person. And obviously it's steel, so this will be my first time seeing it. And I really hope the camera doesn't die while filming this and I have to reshoot it. But yeah, let's see, so peel that tab off. This is actually the first time I've unboxed a new Apple product in probably about actually 10 years, because it was a 20, 2011 MacBook Pro was the last time I bought a new Apple laptop. My current one was bought second hand, so it didn't even come in a box. But yep, yeah, that's it there. Now time to take it out and see what, see what it's like. So, open that there. And obviously with Apple it's worth being careful of the packaging because in terms of resale value, if you can sell it in a box, that's worth quite a bit. I mean, you can even sell the boxes for money. So, yep, there it is. So that's it there, got the Apple logo. Tab to lift it out, very standard for a Mac can just see what this feels like because I've got no idea what this is like weight-wise, size-wise, feel-wise because obviously they've totally changed the style over the previous one. So let's lift it out and see. So, that's it there. It's got a bit of weight to it, but doesn't feel bad. It feels pretty nice at least there. Let's take a look at what we get first. So, I think this is how you do unboxings. I'm not a professional unboxer. But yep, here we go. So this is what we've got accessory-wise. So, we've got a little thing here, a little pocket, definitely not a professional unboxer, I can't think of words. And in here, you get a couple of bits of paper. So you get the manual, presumably, presumably health and safety guide. That just shows where all the ports are and stuff. Health and safety stuff about not eating it or whatever. And then presumably, Apple stickers, presumably. Or that would be sad. Yep, Apple stickers as well, because of course you're gonna get them and then you can stick it on things and go oh look I spent money on a computer or you leave them in the box like I do but yep Apple stickers obviously and now we get to the accessories so here we have the new charger so yep this is a new charger and it's one of the new things with this MacBook Pro is that they've brought MagSafe back so obviously you get the brick here being in the 16 inch this comes with 140 watt brick as standard the 14 inch has two different sizes of bricks I think it's like a 65 watt and a 95 watt or something but yeah, this is the biggest charger. Oops. Oh, I've ripped it now. Oh well. Me saying that about, oh, don't damage the packaging. But yeah, it's just a charger. But yeah, that's the charger there. 140 watt power adapter. So that's it there. You've got the travel plug here, which comes off like that. And then that will obviously go on there. And that's the charger. And yeah, it's quite big, but it's not unsightly. It's not like it's going to be a disaster to carry around. It's definitely a lot smaller than like say the big 130 watt Dell chargers I've used before. This is a lot lighter than that, so it's not like it's too big or anything, it's actually okay. One slight complaint, yep, it's the same complaint I've always had with these. And I'm going to moan, so skip ahead if you don't want me to moan about this. But it's always a thing with these Apple travel plugs that they've never fixed. And that is in the UK, it's a three pin plug with a metal earth pin. But the earth pin isn't actually connected in here. Whereas on the charger, this little stud here is actually an earth terminal. So all they would actually need to do is put a connection from that earth pin there to in here that connects to that stud to ground the charger. And I find that's quite important because even though it's not really a safety thing, if you've ever used a MacBook with one of these sort of travel plugs, and when it's been plugged in and you've run your hand across the surface and you feel a sort of tingling sensation, that's because of this. If you use an earth plug with this charger, it actually doesn't do that. And that's something that I've got here. And this is another thing that's quite a shame it doesn't come with because with Apple up until the 2015, well including the 2015s, they used to include these travel cable, these extended charger cables. And basically it's a big long couple of meter cable, plug there, and that end connects onto the charger. And with this, it is actually earthed. You can see in there there's like a metal contact and that earths the charger. And if you use this, you don't get that tingling sensation. So yeah, if you get that tingling sensation, it annoys you. It's definitely worth picking up these. Apple do sell them, they're about 30 odd pounds, but it's definitely worth it. Although it's a shame they don't include it because they used to include it with the MacBook Pros and that's how I got this one. I got it, I got it with my like 2011 model 
and I still use it because it is good, but yeah. I'm going to stop ranting and get to the machine in a second, but yep. You get the charger like that and that connects onto there, but it is just a shame they still haven't updated this to contain a ground connection here because that would solve that tingling sensation. But yep, that's the charger. Now into more interesting things, MagSafe. So with this machine, they brought MagSafe back, which is really, really good. And it's something I really loved when they had it and really missed it when they got rid of it because yeah, they're like, oh, we want to move to USB-C and get rid of legacy ports and stuff. But the amount, that the, the amount of machines that this can save from people tripping over power cables is huge. And of course, with this, you can still charge it over a USB-C connection. So it's not like if you've got a Thunderbolt dock or a, already have a USB-C charger that you can't use it. You just, this is like an additional way to, way to charge it. So that's really good. Yep, let's get this out of the packaging, which I'm taking an unreasonable amount of care of. There we go. And take a look at it. So yep, that is the MagSafe cable. And it's braided as well, which feels really nice. Very small top on it, end on it. Much smaller than the old MagSafe. I mean, I've not, not used MagSafe 2, I think I've only used the original one, but yeah. Really nice small end and braided cable. But this is something Apple have done, that they've finally done something that makes something maintainable and repairable. Of course, forget about the whole machine, but the charger. This is a USB-C charger and the MagSafe cable is separate. So you plug that in there and the cable is detachable from the charger which is fantastic because it was a common issue on these with the old MagSafe ones where the cable would come out of the charger and it's permanently welded into it and what would end up happening is people would bend it over to wrap the cable around the charger and it would fray and break where it connects to the charger and then you'd have these issues with people going oh my MacBook charger caught fire and it's because they'd bend it over so much and then the cable would break through and wear down here and then it would short out and go bang and the problem is when that happens because cables do wear down over time you have to replace the whole charger. Whereas with this, it's a replaceable cable. So that's actually really good to see. What this also means is that if you've got a compatible USB-C charger, you know, one that's got enough wattage and stuff, and supports power delivery, you don't have to use this brick. You can take that brick, put it away, and use this instead. So you can actually connect this onto whatever charger you want and use MagSafe. So that's potentially useful if you've maybe got, I don't know, some really huge power bank that's capable of powering a laptop, or you've maybe got a multi-port charger that you want to connect it into or something like that, this will actually support that. You can just use a MagSafe cable. So that is really, really nice to have. I suppose even what it also means is if I'm traveling, I can just chuck my, my single laptop charger in my bag, carry the MagSafe cable and a USB-C cable and use the same charger for my laptop and my phone. Whereas previously, if this was a permanently attached MagSafe cable, you couldn't use that to charge a phone. So that's actually really nice. But yep, that's all that unboxed and a bit of a long-winded rant about a plug but that's what I do on this channel. Now time to take a, look, take a look at the laptop itself. So let's get this in here and take a look at it. Okay so here it is, let's unwrap it for the first time and ideally not drop it. So drop it down and there we go. And yep that's where they've said, yep they've engraved that on the bottom and obviously I've gone for the space grey so be interested to see that. Because the videos I have seen have all been of the silver one. I suspect that must have been the sort of review sample that Apple was sending out to people. But this is base grey and that looks really, really nice. So let's turn it over and see what it's like inside. So that's it there. Feels really nice. And actually in the hand, it feels better than my old one. I'll do a comparison later and actually put the two side by side. But the old one had quite sharp edges. Whereas this one, they've sort of rounded the edges out. So actually it's a lot more comfortable to hold, which is nice. But yeah, that can sit down there. Apple logo in the back. Now let's open it up and see if it fires up. I think these things tend to power up automatically. So open it up there. There we go. So if we pull that off the screen. Don't know why that's stuck on there, but There it is. So that is the new MacBook Pro. Booty straight up. Oh, this is the welcome screen so I can continue through the setup wizard here. So, yeah, there we go. That's it working. So yeah, definitely very happy with that. The screen looks amazing, and obviously it's, I don't know what the brightness is set or anything like that, and I've not really looked at that close. Oh, stop language. talking, go Press away. Ah, 
Yeah, anyway, yeah, it's talking to me now. But yeah, it looks really good. And yet, of course, it now has a notch. That's the first thing I noticed as soon as I turned it on. And it'll be interesting to see how this goes in terms of using the software. Because I'm not the sort of person that's going to go full on hating it. Oh my god, it's got a notch, it's terrible. I hate it, never buying a Mac again. Because what they've actually done here with the notch is they've used it to increase the screen height. So it's not like you're getting any less screen space than before by the notch encroaching on it. All they've done is they've extended the screen up into the top bezel. So most of this area will just be taken up by the Mac OS menu bar. And because that's part of the OS, they can kind of work around this notch. And because the screen's higher than 16 by 10, I think it's 16 by 10.4 or something, any sort of 16 by 9 content will just fill the middle of it, not the top where the notch is. So I don't think it'll be a problem, but it's something that I can probably come back to afterwards and go at and explain actually how I find it. It is definitely a little bit unnecessary given it's only got a camera in it, but what I suspect they've done here is they've put it in for future, future expansion with things like Face ID. So they're not going to put Face ID in this particular module, but what this means is in the future, if they do want to introduce it, which I suspect they will, they can add it in with all the appropriate IR cameras and not have to change the appearance. So it's not like, oh, we've brought in, IR, brought in Face ID, but now you have a notch. People get the notch, they get used to it, and then they add Face ID into it. So yeah, that's probably my prediction as to what will happen. But yeah, it doesn't really bother me too much, but it'll be interesting to see what happens in software. But also just looking at that keyboard, looks really nice, that black background looks really good. When I'd seen pictures of it and even videos of it, I wasn't a big fan of this because I felt it looked like when you have a MacBook and someone puts one of those like rubber keyboard protectors over it just because the whole thing was one colour and it didn't look that good. But actually in person, that looks really good. It doesn't look like that at all in person. It looks really, really nice. Final thing is what does the keyboard feel like? Yep, that's a lot better. <laughs> that is probably the main reason I went for this machine is because my current machine is a 2016 with a butterfly keyboard and it's not the original butterfly, that was the 12 inch MacBook. It's basically the first butterfly keyboard in a MacBook Pro and yeah, it's pretty bad. So yeah, this keyboard is so much better. But yeah, that is working. Use British English to Stop talking to me. Press the return key. But yeah, that's there. So what I'll do is I'll go away off camera and just run through the setup wizard just to get it all working. Then I'll come back and show it off, do a couple of performance tests, and then give my first impressions. So now before I go and set it up, let's take a quick tour of the hardware. So here it is here. It's got a really nice flat shape to it. Looks really good. We'll do a comparison to the old machine later, but I do much prefer this. It feels a little bit bulkier, but it's not much larger or thicker or anything. It's just, I think, the, the shape. This is more flat, whereas the other one's tapered. But we'll do a comparison between those two later. But yeah, in terms of style, I absolutely love it. It's such a nice looking machine. It definitely sort of lines up with my personal style preferences, which is good. So we take a look at the ports around the side. We can see that Apple have finally listened and actually brought ports back, which is amazing and weirdly surprising. But yeah, it's really good. So on this side, you get your two Thunderbolt 4 ports, which I'll, I'll use extensively. Obviously, the work is USB-C. I use a Thunderbolt dock. It's extremely useful. Headphone jack. And apparently this now has support for high impedance headphones. Unfortunately, this machine arrived much earlier than expected, so I don't have time to go into the office and get my 250 ohm headphones to try it with. But apparently it does have support for high impedance headphones. And a friend tried, it, tried his this morning with high impedance 250 ohm headphones, and apparently it can drive them. So that's really quite good. So if you've got good headphones, you don't necessarily need, need an external DAC. And then we've got MagSafe. So MagSafe is finally back. So I mentioned that earlier, and yep, it works. So you've got a laptop there, MagSafe charger there, and it will, well, magnetically attach. And obviously if you trip over the cable, it rips off. So it's great to see that coming back. The only weird thing I noticed, it's just, it's a very, very minor gripe, but it just feels a bit like non apple is the MagSafe connector is silver, despite this being a spray screen machine. So when you plug it in, there is a noticeable colour difference between the two. Really stupid thing to moan about, but given Apple's done that historically where like space grey stuff's come with black lightning cables and things like that, it's a little bit weird that they've not actually made a separate colour of that, but yeah, it doesn't really bother me at all. But yeah, it's really nice having MagSafe. The only downside I sort of spotted with MagSafe here though, is that you now have to plug the charger into the left-hand side of the machine. And that's something I liked about using the USB-C chargers because you could plug it into either side. Now, of course, as I mentioned before, there's nothing stopping you using a USB-C charger with this. You could even use the brick it comes with and just buy a USB-C cable if that was really an issue. 
But I only really noticed it here because I've set it up on the table to test it all out. And I put the laptop down there and it's plugged into an extension cable off to the side of the, off to the, on the floor down there. I mean, I had the charger plugged in. I had to put the charger on the table because the charger sits on the floor. This cable isn't long enough to reach into the left-hand side of the laptop, but it would be long enough to plug it into the right-hand side of the laptop. I mean, I've done videos before with my old laptop. I would just plug the cable on the side and it was fine. So really, really minor gripe, but that's one slight disadvantage of MagSafe is just that you can't plug the charger to both sides now. But well, you can, you just need a USB-C charger, not the MagSafe charger. So yeah, it's a bit of a non-issue, but it's just something I noticed. But yeah, I would much rather have MagSafe than being able to plug it into both sides because this is just so useful and could save so many damaged ports. In fact, on my old MacBook Pro, I've noticed that one, of, I traditionally just out of habit always plug the charger into the top right hand Thunderbolt port and that port is now slightly looser. You do notice it's looser than all the other ports just because it gets used more. So MagSafe should also be much more durable, which is good. So now if we take a look around the right hand side, we can see we have more ports. So we've got another Thunderbolt 3 port or Thunderbolt 4, 4 port, sorry, and an HDMI port. And this is one of the ports they brought back. And this is why I'm not bothered about it being slightly thicker, because I would much rather have a slightly thicker machine if it means it can fit something like HDMI. I've seen a few people complaining because it's HDMI 2.0, not HDMI 2.1, but you can still do that sort of high speed stuff over the Thunderbolt ports. I'd view this more as a convenience thing. Not having an HDMI port can just get quite annoying, especially if you're in places like say a conference room or a, something like that and you're giving a talk and you need to plug your laptop into a screen that's HDMI and you've got your adapter so you have to go and wander around trying to find someone who's got an adapter and your conference starts in five minutes and I've been there before. It's just really nice having that on board because it's almost like in the past where all that stuff was VGA and then Apple removed VGA ports and then people got annoyed because they couldn't plug into that. But since then, all these conference places with their displays and projectors have all standardised on HDMI. So you're going to have HDMI ports around for a very long time. So having that is just so useful. So I'm really glad they brought that back. And then the final thing they've brought back is the SD card reader, which I'm so glad to have. Because even though on my desk I've got a Thunderbolt 3 dock that has a built-in SD card reader, a lot of the time when I'm editing videos, I want to just sit on the couch. What I'll usually do, my, my workflow, if you could call it that, is I'll just sort of sit on the couch when I'm relaxing and I'll import the videos, clip it all together, cut bits out, just get the basic stuff done. And then when I actually want to do things like colour grading or audio work, I'll go through and sit at my desk and plug it into the dock. But that means when I'm actually importing the footage, I'm not necessarily connected to my dock. It's not the biggest deal in the world. I just use this cheap little USB-C dongle I've had for years. And that works fine. It's got an SD card reader. But... The number of times I sat down to do it and I've forgotten this and had to go and get it and things like that is a little bit annoying. But the other benefit of this is this is actually a UHS-2 card reader. I hadn't really thought about it, but then when I was importing footage for a video editing test I'll do later, I just used an SD card to copy it over because I didn't have a big flash drive lying around. And it was able to copy the footage super quickly. So it's really good to have a UHS-2 card reader because that is much faster than the card reader in these sort of cheap dongles here. So you actually get a benefit with the internal card reader as well. So yeah, it's really good to have that. Apart from that, not much else to report, just really, really nice hardware, big vent around the back. And then if we open it up, we can take a look at the inside of it. So open that up. The instant wake from sleep is insane. Like I know all the memes and stuff of Tim Cook doing that and this thing when he's kneeling down, but literally it starts up like literally instantly. Okay, not in, it, you know, there's, a, there's a fraction of a second there, but you know, it's super fast. You've got Touch ID there. It's really, really good. And yeah, I'm not going to rattle on too much about the inside because I already talked about this when I first looked, but the keyboard looks amazing. I really like this black background. The feel is fantastic, especially coming from a, a butterfly keyboard. And in fact, one thing I noticed earlier, because I'm on the early butterfly, it doesn't have a physical escape key. I can't remember what I was doing. I was doing something where I needed to press escape, and I almost found myself like just naturally just trying to be quite precise and tap the touch bar escape key and I had this sort of moment of wait I've got a real escape key I can just like press there in that area and it'll work I don't have to like delicately press where it is on the touch bar and it was actually really quite a sort of oh yeah escape keys can be physical so that was really nice the other thing I noticed as well it's a bit of a difference is actually the ventilation so if we look back here probably won't see on camera but there's really big air vents in the screen hinge which the old machine didn't really have. The old machine had a sort of quite a, a hard bit of plastic as part, as part of the hinge mechanism here. 
so there wasn't actually much space for the air vents. So not only are the fans really loud on that and run constantly because it's Intel, it also meant that because the air was squeezing out through a very small gap, it was probably adding a bit to the noise because a lot of the noise did sound like the air cuts that were being forced out into more air turbulence rather than just fan noise. So when the fan does kick on on this, I'm hoping that'll actually make it a lot quieter and provide better airflow. So yeah, that's looking look at the hardware. Now let's talk about using it. Okay, so now back and I've got the machine set up. So I've set it up, installed a few apps, nothing major. Again, this is just a very quick sort of first look. But we'll just go through, take a look at how I found it, talk a little bit about the hardware. And then what I'll do is I'll get my old laptop in and we'll do some performance comparisons. Because obviously there's a lot of people out there doing performance comparisons between this generation and then the one before it or whatever. But I'm upgrading from 2016 to the new one. So it'll be really interesting to see what a more real world upgrade would be like. You know, someone who's had their machine for a few years like me and is now moving to this. Because not many people are going to buy the 2020 16 inch and then jump straight to this. So actually seeing what a performance difference of over a few years of machines is like. So that'll be really interesting to try out. But yeah, I've got it here. And my first impressions are the screen is amazing. It's a really, really good screen. And it goes super bright. I mean, that's a full brightness, but this is obviously under bright studio lights. It's not like retina burning level that I thought it might be, but it's still really bright and it'll be amazing in sunlight. And when it comes to the mini LED, I immediately noticed that. And it's something that has actually kind of changed my perception of displays because eventually down the line I'll get a new TV and I was thinking, oh, I'll get an OLED, you know, OLED's good, you know, dark blacks and stuff. But actually trying this out, I honestly can't see a reason to really go for OLED over this because it's, it's got such deep blacks. In particular, if you're watching a full screen video like this, you really notice it. Because you'll notice here this video is obviously full screen and this was what I was saying where you don't actually see the notch because the 16 by 9 content fits in the middle. But you can see obviously at the bottom here and at the top, there's obviously black bars. But you genuinely cannot see them. Like, if I look at the notch there, I cannot see that. You, the only way you can really see the notch is to like properly tilt, tip the screen back and like look for it. So the blacks are properly deep. Whereas on a traditional LCD, you would definitely be able to tell the difference between the black of the black bar letterbox in the content and then the actual bezel of the screen. So yeah, the actual blacks are extremely good. And I've not noticed any sort of, um, what do they call it? Blooming, where like, you, you know, you have like say the mouse cursor or something and you see a little bit of LED around it from the backlight. I've not seen any of that. Now that's probably something more to talk about when I do this sort of full review because that'll get, you know, there'll be a bit more sort of experience with it and I'll view more content on it. But at first glance, I can't really see any of that, which is really good. The only thing I have noticed with the display is a bit of ghosting. It's more noticeable on things like this, where you've got something very light against a dark background. And if you move it around, it might not show up on camera that well, but you do get kind of a ghosting effect behind like the Apple logo and the text. And at first I kind of went, oh, that's not very good. But then I looked at my old laptop and it actually has probably a similar level of ghosting. Same with my desktop monitors. But I think on this it's a bit more pronounced purely because of the high refresh rate. Because when you because after using this and kind of getting used to the high refresh rate, which felt quite nice, going back to my old laptop, it didn't feel remotely as smooth. And sure enough, if you do a similar test dragging something like this around, you still see the ghosting, but because it's not as smooth, it's not that 120 hertz display, it's just a 60 hertz display. I don't know, you don't spot it as much. But it's not really a big deal. You only really notice it if you're like, you know, being silly and dragging a window around. During general use, I'm not noticing it. And I have to say, the 120Hz refresh rate display is amazing. It just makes stuff feel so much smoother. Motion just feels really, really nice. And it's the sort of thing that I think if you've not used a 120Hz display before, like I'd never really used one, you don't really appreciate it. But then for me jumping onto this, I really notice the difference now. And then going back to my old display or my monitors, you actually do notice the slower refresh rate. I really do not want to have to buy new monitors to try and get used to try and bring them up to this refresh rate as well, but it is really, really good. Another thing I mentioned earlier was how the notch will kind of just sit in the menu bar so it won't get in the way of content, and that's definitely true. And then if you full screen an app, it just puts a basically a black bar around where this top bar is, so you don't really see the notch. But as far as I'm aware, developers can actually switch that on or off. They can say they want to incorporate the notch into their application and then fill up to the top of the screen. And one thing I have noticed that's definitely, definitely noticeable, but I'll definitely get used to it, is that they've increased the height of the menu bar slightly because the old menu bar would kind of just, it wouldn't fill up right to the height, the height of the notch. They've definitely made that taller. 
in particular, I don't use my machine at its native like more space or standard size scaling. So like on the display, I don't use it at default for this display or the one that says default, which apparently looks like 1728 by 1117 on this new display. I always use it on the more space one to get a bit more screen real estate. And that apparently looks like 2056 by 1329, bit of a random resolution. But I use it at that. And what I noticed is that previously when you went between default and more space, the menu bar would massively shrink in height. Whereas now, it the text gets smaller on the menu bar, but the actual bar itself only shrinks in height by maybe one or two pixels. So the menu bar is definitely taller. That did initially concern me, but I did a bit of a test. And as far as I can tell, even on this, with that whole notch in the whole menu bar, you still get a tiny bit more vertical space than on the older machine. So let's take a look at that. So this is the quick test I've come up with here. It's definitely not very scientific, but I came up with it in a couple of minutes. But essentially what I've got here is I've got two machines, my new one and the old one, and on both of them I full screened Chrome. This is just Chrome running a blank, showing a blank page. And as you can see on the new machine, it just puts a bezel at the top of the screen. You don't see the notch, it kind of just, the bezel just disappears, so it doesn't really get in the way of the content. And even just looking at these two machines side by side, that top bezel, including the notch, is actually smaller than the actual bezel on the 25th, on the 15 inch 2016 machine. What I've then done is I've opened up a Chrome JavaScript debugger and I've just looked at the variable which is window.visualviewport.height and I've checked that on both machines and that's basically the height in pixels of this white area so essentially what your content would be, your web page, whatever you've got there. On the older machine that is 1200 pixels which is correct because this is set to the same scaling as this the maximum scaling, and on this machine that apparently looks like 1920 by 1200, so that's that's correct. On here, apparently it's 1286 high, so it's 86 pixels more vertically on this machine than on this machine, even when the top of the screen is sort of blacked out because of the notch. So that's actually okay. I'm not losing any vertical screen space, which is something I really care about. Now the only other thing to bear in mind though of course is this is a 16 inch machine, this is a 15 inch machine so there is a chance that the 16 inch without the notch the previous generation might have been taller vertically I'm not sure, I don't have one to test with but yeah, going from this to this I'm actually gaining vertical space even if I don't incorporate the notch and obviously with the notch there and once I'm, not, I'm outside of an application I've now got all of this extra space that previously I didn't have and of course once I've not got something full screen and I've got a windowed application I'll have all this extra space, which on this machine would be taken up by the menu bar, because on here, the menu bar is nudged up. So yeah, the screen's absolutely amazing. The 120Hz refresh rate is great. And the notch doesn't really bother me. I do notice it there, but I think I'll get used to it. It's maybe worth if you use light desktop backgrounds, but that's not me, that's, that shouldn't bother me at all. And yeah, having that additional vertical screen space, especially when using window, windowed applications with the menu bar visible, will be really worthwhile. So before we dive into the performance tests and then wrap up, we'll take a quick look at the hardware comparison between the two as well. Because one of the big comments I've seen is people saying how big the new one is. And it is a bit chunkier, but not by much. Thickness-wise, they're very similar. I think it's like a fraction of a millimetre between the two. But the difference is that this one's tapered. So on the old machine, it's got a sort of tapered design where it's quite thick in the middle, but it noticeably tapers out towards the edges on both the top and the bottom and that means that at the edges it's very thin. Whereas on the new machine, they've got rid of that. It's now totally flat across the top and the bottom with rounded edges. So that's why it feels a bit thicker because it is thicker at the edges. It's just not tapered. But to be honest, I don't think it's gonna make a huge difference to me. Realistically, if I'm transporting these, neither of the, like this is not gonna be harder to transport than this. They're both already fairly large laptops, but still quite thin. I can't see myself finding a situation where I've got a bag that this fits in and this doesn't. And the weight difference, well, I think this is heavier, I've not checked. It doesn't feel much heavier. You can maybe notice a slight difference, but it's not, again, going to be a big difference at all. So the size difference doesn't really bother me. The other thing I'm interested in checking, I actually haven't checked off camera, is the difference between the two machines, like, footprint-wise, because obviously I've got a 15-inch and this is a 16-inch. And to be honest, basically nothing. Yeah, you're maybe looking about, I don't know, five mil wider on either side, so like a centimetre wider. I mean, this is me purely guessing. I mean, Apple do publish the specs. And then round that way, again, 
tiny bit deeper front to back, but not really a big difference at all. That's not going to bother me. It's definitely not going to be any harder to transport. So size-wise, I'm, I'm weight. I've not got a problem with it because I have seen people going, oh, it's too bunky, but, uh, bulky. At least for me, it's not going to be too bulky at all. And in terms of aesthetics, even when it's shut, I much prefer the new design. I really like the sort of flat sort of, I prefer sort of flat shapes with like curved, like rounded edges and stuff, not sort of bulbous shapes that taper off like this one does. It looks a lot more modern. And it's weird because it kind of gives vibes of both a modern iPad and an old power book. So like modern Apple and super old Apple because the old power books were very similar. They had a sort of flat top rounded corners and yeah, it's weird. It's a sort of hybrid of old and new. It's really, really nice. So now it's time for the moment of truth. Let's take a look at some performance comparisons between the two machines. So first of all, we're going to use Geekbench, obviously. Everyone uses Geekbench. On the, on the old one, we can see here, it's got the i7-6820HQ and 16 gigs of RAM. And this machine's got the M1 Max and 32 gigs of RAM. Now, I will confess they do have different macOS versions. This is Big Sur, this is Monterey, just because I haven't updated this yet, but hopefully it'll be similar enough. And obviously that's now set up for Apple Silicon there, and this is set up for Intel here. So let's run the CPU benchmark at the same time and see what happens. There we go. So now they're both running through. I will notice that the M1 machine took a little bit longer to gather system information, so that might screw the time that it takes to run the test off, but the actual result will be in the score, not necessarily how long it takes to finish. But yeah, let's let these tests run and see what the results are. Although visually looking now, I'm pretty sure that progress bar is further along already. Yeah, it definitely is. So yeah, straight away that's getting ahead, even though it actually had a head start, or this machine had a head start. So yeah, let's just let this run and see what the results are. I suspect it'll be quite a big improvement because obviously a lot of people are going, look how much faster M1 is than an i9. And it's like, no, this is between this and the Skylake i7, so there should be quite a big difference here. It'll let us test run and see what it comes out with. And there we go, that's the results. So, well, sorry, the results for the new one, the old one's still going. But yep, single core score of 17, or 1779, which is about right. The M1 Pro and M1 Max have similar single core performance than M1 because that's essentially all they are. They're just M1s but with more cores. So that's still incredibly good single core performance. It'll be interesting to see what this thing gets. And then multi-core is 12,702, which as far as I'm aware is really, really high. Let's see, rough comparison to other Macs. Um, multi-core, so 12,000 odd, is basically somewhere between a late 2019 Mac, Mac Pro with 12 cores and an, eight, an 18 core iMac Pro, so that's pretty high. So yeah, the performance of the CPU is huge. And if you actually look at like a pro processor benchmark chart and look at multi-core in here, we're kind of sitting, let's see, what was it, 12702? Around i9, desktop i9 Xeon W level, AMD Epic, like super powerful. But oh, the old one's done now. Uh, oh, wrong button. Um, yeah, that's quite a performance difference. If you just go a little bit closer and just look at those numbers. Um, single core on the new one, 1779. Old one, 861. Old one, multi core score, 3467. New one, 12702. That's quite a difference, I would say. So, yeah, that's a very impressive performance difference between the two. Obviously, it's to be expected, there's about five years between these two machines. But still, or four years because this is late 2016, but still, massive performance improvement. Next up, we'll do a GPU benchmark, and I suspect this will be quite a big difference as well. So on the old machine, we've got the Radeon Pro 455, and on the new machine, we've also got the M1 Max 32 core. And we're going to use the Metal API for both, just for the comparison between these two machines. So let's run GPU Compute Benchmark and see what happens. So that's now running. Again, it takes longer to gather, gather system information on this, don't know why, but yeah, let that run and see what the results are. I suspect this will be quite a big difference. Oh, the results are in on the new one and the old one's in. Yeah, probably have to pause for that thing so long, but yeah, 
that has now got a score, a metal score of six, 60,306. So that's pretty high. Also, let's go and take it. We can go and take a look at the metal benchmark chart to see what that compares to. And if we look here, that's 6306, which, yep, yeah, that is in the sort of real realms of Radeon RX 5700s, Vega 64s, you know, desktop cards, but in a laptop. And obviously, there are some more higher ones, you know, super high end desktop Radeons and dual GPU things and stuff like that. But that is still really, really, really powerful. Like, yeah. Oh, it's done. Let's see how this compares. Ah, yeah, so 12,830 versus 60,000. So, yeah, five, five times GPU power or something in this over this. That's quite significant. So now for another test, let's try Cinebench. At this point, I'm just trying to embarrass this old machine because there's no chance it's going to be anywhere close. But we'll start a multi-core Cinebench test and run that. See how quick the, quick the difference is because this has got a visual test to see the performance difference. Oh, I didn't press start, whoops. Oh, it is. Ah, well, okay, um, we'll start that again, but yeah, that's a bit of an outtake there. I, I, it literally took so long to start, I actually didn't, I thought I hadn't pressed the start button. Right, let's try that again, and actually just be aware that this takes a little bit longer to start than I thought. So, let's press start at the same time. There we go. And that's now running, this one's still starting. And it's now started now, and there's just not really much comparison between the two of them. Like, yeah, that is a bit ridiculous. Now, of course, there is a level of this being 10 core and this being 4 core, but yeah, it's just not anywhere close. The other thing I'm noticing is the dreaded fan noise. I can hear the fans starting on the Intel machine, definitely. The Apple Silicon machine is just vaguely warm on the bottom, like slightly warm, whereas this one is already getting quite hot on the bottom and the fans have kicked in, whereas, yeah, I don't think the fans are running on this one. So yeah, not only is this one a lot faster, this one's now getting hotter and louder and I can hear those fans still ramping up. So that's finished there and it's got a score of where is it? How did I get the score? 12,376 points. I've just started, I didn't do a full many pass thing, but yeah. 12,376 12, points, which puts it well above a 999800 Ryzen 7 7700X. Obviously, it's not ideal, it's not showing many CPUs, but that is a pretty good score. And when this one finishes, we'll see where it lands. Was it frozen? Nope, it's not frozen, it's just, uh, oh, it's rendering a slightly detailed area and it's really not happy. Right, let's see what score this thing gets. Okay, it's now finally done. My audio recorder ran out of storage because it's taken that long, so I had to stop, but it's now finished and the fan got very loud and that's now so hot that I would be uncomfortable having that on my lap, which was always a bit annoying if I was editing the video with the laptop on my lap, it would get really hot. But yeah, we've now got a result. So the score on this one was 4,350, so... 4,350, 12,376. You get the message here, it's getting, it's, it's a lot faster. Now the final test I want to do is a disk speed test, just to see the difference between the two SSDs. So I'm just going to use the Blackmagic disk speed test, just a standard test, and we'll do a comparison. So check these have the same sort of thing, 5 gig file on that one, 5 gig file on that one, start a test, and see how the SSDs compare. So that's a uh, 6,000 megabytes second write and 5,500 read and that's 1,000 write and 1,800 read. I mean, don't get me wrong, this is still a very fast SSD, but this is just a bit faster, shall we say. So, yeah, even the SSD performance is massively different. And while we're on the topic of speed tests, I want to test out that card reader properly and just show a comparison between having a normal SD card reader and a UHS-2 card reader. So this is my UHS-2 card here. It's actually the one I was filming this video on, so I've had to put another card in for this. But yeah, it's a standard Lexar, like Lexar Professional 128 gig card. It's a relatively cheap one, but you can see there it's rated for 250 megabytes a second. But if you turn it around, you can see it's a UHS-2 card. If you compare that to a traditional SD card or an adapter because I didn't have another one handy, 
you can see a traditional SD card only has a row of one row of pins, whereas UHS-2 has that and it's backwards compatible, but it's got these additional pins here for higher bandwidth. And that's, a bit, and that's how a UHS-2 card works. So if you put this in a normal card reader, it still works. It just only uses the top pins at a slower speed. But if you have a UHS-2 card reader, it uses these additional pins to get faster speeds. So first of all, I'll try this in the old card reader, the one I've used for quite a while, well, since I got my old MacBook Pro, actually. I think I bought it the day I, got, I think I bought this the day I bought this, because back then you really needed dongles. Nowadays, I've standardized everything on USB-C, so I don't really need it now. But that's it in. So if we go in here, change the target drive, and we'll change that to the SD card, open, do a 5GB file again, and start a test. And there we go, that's writing about 78, 80 megabytes a second, 75, 76, high 70 megabytes a second, and then reading about, yeah, 83 megabytes a second, something like that. Not terrible, but obviously not as fast as that card can do. So we stop that unmount the drive because I'm going to behave and do it properly on camera because people will complain and then take that out we can then put the card into the machine's internal SD card reader which is now going to be UHS 2 might need to change the target drive again there we go open and run it again with a UHS 2 card reader so you see we're writing there now about 100 megabytes a second which is just the right speed of the card that's more than fast enough to write footage to it the main thing will be the read though, because that's what I want to ingest from. And there you go. 220 megabytes a second. Yep, 222 megabytes a second. So that is hugely faster. It's several times faster than the old basic card reader. And that'll make a big difference, because just ingesting footage off the SD card takes quite a while when I'm editing videos just to copy it all off. Oh yep, they're now at 250 megabytes a second, which is the rated speed of the card. And this card's been used quite heavily. So yeah, that is really impressive. And that'll be a nice, just well, it's just one of those nice to have things, just being able to ingest footage off the card quicker will just be a nice thing to have, and it's really nice having that built into the machine. So synthetic benchmarks are all well and good, but what really matters to me is real world performance. There's a lot of different tests I could use, but I've decided just to do a simple video rendering test because I'm very familiar with that and I've already got all that ready. So what I've done is I've taken my project I did for my latest video, which was the Network Up Cabinet Upgrade, and copied that onto both machines. And I use DaVinci Resolve, so both machines are running the latest version of Resolve. And all I'll do is I'll just do the same export on both, which is just a standard H.264 export with 24-bit linear PCM audio. It's just what I've always done. With this new machine, I'll now have an H.265 acceleration, so I'll probably move on to starting to export H.265, but that would be a fair comparison because this machine doesn't have any accelerated H.265 hardware, so the performance would be absolutely dreadful. But yep, we've got both projects set up, so now if we hit render we should see quite a difference. Now bear in mind that I currently only edit 1080p, so even this old machine can still render that perfectly fast, it renders really quickly. I was always really impressed. But this machine should hopefully be a bit quicker, and I imagine it, not, maybe not in the immediate future, but at least within the lifetime of this machine, I'll probably end up going to 4K, at which point I'll notice a huge difference. It's really annoying because my one of the previous videos I did, it was the house networking one, I filmed on my phone which was 4K, so I actually had a 4K project, so I could have used I could have used that to test and then stupidly deleted it the other day, but yeah, let's run this test and see what the rendering performance difference is like. Three, two, one, go. So there we go, that's now rendering. So let's start off. Oh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, there's there's a difference. So this one is rendering 181 frames a second, this is rendering 287 frames a second. That's quite a bit quicker, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's more than I thought it would be I was honestly thinking that it'll get to a point where because it's 1080p the performance difference between the two mach machines won't really make a big difference but that's definitely shown otherwise I mean it's not like it's double the performance it's still quite a lot more though but I imagine it'll get even better when I start doing things like effects or the sections in this video that are sped up which this machine really struggles with hopefully this one will be a lot faster and it'll allow me to do much more advanced editing. And it's still rendering, but it's got a few seconds remaining and I've lost track of the time, so we'll wait for this to finish and see how long it actually took, and then compare that to this machine that's been done for quite a while. So, yeah, still going, fans are absolutely screaming, it's far too hot to the touch. And that finished in 15 minutes and 8 seconds, which isn't bad for a, you know, 45 minute video, until you realise that this one finished that one in 9 minutes and 19 seconds, so easily five minutes quicker than this. 
and that's only at 1080p with a fairly basic project. So I imagine if I added a lot more into it, this would be even faster, because this probably isn't even being fully utilised. And when I was talking about fan noise, and I think with this one I mentioned, all oh, the fans might come on soon, they didn't. Stay totally fanless the whole time, whereas this thing is still running its fans trying to cool itself down afterwards, so yeah. Video rendering performance is pretty noticeably better on the new one. And yeah, I'm not using it to its full potential, but if I go to 4K, I'll probably notice it more. So I decided to do another test, and I've just started the same render again, but this time opened up Activity Monitor. And you can see on the old machine, we've got the two GPUs, we've got the Radeon GPU and the Intel HD graphics. And you can see the Radeon GPU is totally maxed out, and the Intel HD graphics is about half. I mean, that's probably Intel QuickSync. And you can see the CPU cores, but half of them are, are fairly highly utilised, half of them aren't, just because they're hyperthreading cores. Whereas if we look at the M1 Max machine, we can see that we've actually hit a point where the, it's now going through a sped up section, hence why the GPU has just dropped down a little bit. I'll come out that in a second. But you can see on here, we're using more than half of the GPU. Uh, maybe two thirds, maybe just like a bit less than that. This is me trying to justify that it's definitely worth it over the 16 core having the 32 core because we're using slightly more than half. I'm just trying to justify bad financial decisions. But we're using, you know, way less than the full capacity of the GPU and the CPU is barely being touched. So that also explains partially why it's running so cool. I mean, also it's just more efficient, but we're barely even utilizing it to get this level of performance. So it's performing much faster, but also not even utilizing the hardware fully. So that'll be really interesting to see once I start putting more effects in, doing more colour grading, using 4K footage, and I can fully utilise this machine. That performance should be absolutely mental. So yeah, pretty interesting test. This new thing's just insane. So finally we've got one more test to do. And I know I keep saying finally, because I keep saying finally and then thinking of more tests to do. We'll check it with my docking station. Because this is one of the main reasons I couldn't buy an M1 machine. And that's because they only support a single external display. And I've got two 4K monitors. And they go into this CalDigit TS3 Plus docking station, which I've had for quite a while, and I absolutely love it, it works really well. So I've got a docking station, and then into that I've got both monitors, Ethernet network, audio interface, keyboard, mouse, mm, I think, yeah, a unifying receiver somewhere. It's So everything can, is connected into that dock, and I plug it into the laptop with a single cable. So, moment of truth, will M1 Max, and presumably M1 Pro as well, work with both these displays and the Thunderbolt dock? So, get that in. The port's moved from the previous machine, so I'm plugging that into MagSafe port, which isn't right. There we go, put that in. It's recognised it. And hopefully... There we go, I've got both displays now. The key thing is, are they mirrored, or are they independent displays? Yep, they're independent displays. Obviously the order's totally off, but they're working as independent displays, so... Keyboard Setup Assistant, continue... That the keyboard up and obviously the monitors are scaled to a horrifically small size but we can bring that around there it is working independently going to displays can we get them well that's a new interface Oof, that's, um, there's two displays there display settings I presume I can change them scaled yes yeah, so they're currently set to some horrific scaling so I clearly want them to be more space because they're 4k there we go and then same on the other one make that one there also scales to be natively 4K and make everything nice and tiny. Actually, I might be able to do it. In, in fact, actually, I probably can do it in between. I'm doing that off camera, whoops. Um, because this was a thing. On my old machine, if I set it to a scaled resolution at 4K and not native 4K, you get this little thing that says using a scaled resolution may affect performance. And on my old machine, if you did that, it would make video editing a really slow experience having a scaled resolution on these external displays. So hopefully that won't be an issue with these ones. I'll set it as a native 4K for now, but I just thought that is actually an issue I had with the old machine's performance, was that it really struggled to scale these 4K displays. So hopefully that'll help, but yep, that's now scaled. And if we just sort of rearrange these to be correct. What's that? That's there, and that is there. And there we go, we now natively have two external displays on an Apple Silicon machine. So, yep, that definitely works. And then, very quickly, because all this video is dragging on, go to network. Yep, it's also got Thunderbolt Ethernet as well, so the Ethernet's also worked. Presumably the audio devices will also be showing up correctly. I mean, the mouse is definitely working, the keyboard's working, so there, so the USB's working. Sound devices, yep, the output device is there. So, yep, my entire desk setup works through my dock, so 
yeah, that's great. So there you go. That was a look at the brand new M1 Max MacBook Pro. I was going to say it was quite a quick run through of it, but I don't know how much footage I've recorded. It's probably going to be one of my epic long videos, despite being a quick unboxing, but we'll see. But yeah, this thing seems really, really good. Obviously, I've not used it much. I've literally set it up, tested it out, got it worked, got it working, installed Resolve and a few benchmarks and tried it. So it'll be really inter interesting to see how I find using it long term. So if there is anything major to report or just anything that's sort of interesting I can make a video on, I'll probably do a follow up video in a while and actually just go into more detail. But on first, my first impressions are that this thing is absolutely amazing and it is such an improvement over the old one. So yeah, time to finish up, edit the video, which I'll be doing on this machine and try and get it up on YouTube as quickly as possible while the hype for these machines is still there. So yeah, can't wait to try editing a video on this because if the rendering performance is anyth anything to go by, it's going to be a really fun time. So yeah, thank you very much for watching.